I'm going to ask Michael to come up and share, and then I'm, I've got something. The words of that song, and I, I never get away from it, all my life you have been faithful. Um, and when you get as old as John, it <laughs> really does. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes I think we, we don't fully grasp the meaning of Easter. This Easter really snuck up on me. I, did, I wasn't aware of it. I, it wasn't until a week ago that I realised we were moving into that Easter celebration. Yeah. The amazing thing about it is, and I'll start, give you a couple of scriptures as a foundation. In Timothy it says, even though we are... We can be faithless. He remains faithful. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. One of the amazing things in life, and particularly the, f the longer you live, the older you get, the more you recognize the times that if it wasn't for his faithfulness, if it wasn't for his faithfulness, and that's the message of Easter, is that, Right back in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, and he gave us everything, and we faithlessly rejected God and all that he gave us, and we walked away. And he said, the, the, if you eat the fruit of that tree, if you are not faithful to me, you will die. And the death that he was talking about was separation from him. In Romans it says, while you were dead in your trespasses and sins, Christ died for us. While we were dead, we were once dead to God, but now we're made alive to him in Christ. And when Jesus died on the cross, the cry on the cross was, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this is the faithfulness of God. When we rejected him, we died to him. And there was no way we could come back to him in relationship at all. And so when Jesus came, when the Son of God came, he experienced the God forsakenness that we live in every day. The fact that we could not come to the Father because our sin, sin separated us from him. The sin of judging God to be a bad God. When Jesus experienced that on the cross, he took into himself that God forsakenness, the thing that separated, the thing, the thing that stopped the Father reaching out to us and having intimacy with us was our rejection of him. And when Jesus took that into himself, suddenly the reason was gone. The guilt of sin was broken. It's the guilt of sin that keeps us away from him. Suddenly, it's all gone. And whenever we think about the cross, whenever we think about communion, remember one thing. There is now no reason why the Father cannot be faithful to you. There's no reason to stop him. Not even your faithlessness can stop him. He is no longer able to not be your friend. He is no longer able to reject you. He never wanted to. But now, there is nothing that stops him. And it doesn't matter that I forgot that I was so caught up in my own little insignificant world that I forgot that Easter was coming. I forgot that the celebration of the resurrection was coming and the intimacy that we have with him. That intimacy is always there regardless of how hard I try to forget it. It doesn't matter how. You know, it, it's, it's, like, it's like you can never get a like with God, but, you know, this is about the closest I can get. It's like it doesn't matter how much I want to take my wife for granted. She comes and stands in front of me and says, I need a hug. I'm like, oh, right. And it doesn't matter how much. 
we get caught up within ourselves. Never think that suddenly you are no longer worthy of his love, his fellowship, his faithfulness. He's always there. He doesn't go. It doesn't matter. We can, we can be faithless. We can be caught up in stuff. You know, and, and it reaffirmed it when we are singing that song that, uh, well, number one, all my life you've been faithful. The um, revel Jesus Revolution. I remember, uh, I remember back in those days listening to all that music, and you're in the, you're in this, I don't know, this aura of God's presence in the early days of salvation and and this Jesus people movement, you know, and, and getting caught up in that, and it's all nostalgic. Then you move down in life, you forget. But he doesn't. He never did. So always remember. And this is what communion is about. I will never leave you nor will I forsake you. At all. He's always there. Amen. <clears throat> so Easter's kind of one of the coolest holidays for me. I was born on Easter morning. Yep, my mama wasn't in church. <laughs> Neither was I. And I was born April 10th. And my brother is four years older than me. I'm April 10th. He's uh, March 27th, about 25th. <laughs> Barely remember mine, let alone his. He was born on Easter morning. Yeah, it's kind of strange, isn't it? God tried to pull all the stops out to try to help us because he knew he needed every bit we could get. Anyway, so stories. I want to tell you a story. So glad uh, everybody's talked about Jesus because I want to talk about somebody else. Uh, stories. They're the most powerful thing in our life, really. They're what define us, they're what lead us, they're what take us up or take us down, is stories. So a good story always starts in the beginning. In the beginning. Now, there's how this is going to go down. I'm going to tell this story. You're going to get encouraged, hopefully. A little bit of instructions. And then it's your choice. So this story begins in the beginning, in the beginning, when there was nothing but chaos. There was building materials, but it was all chaotic and darkness and confusion and the creator of all things said, I'm going to do something today. And he said, let there be light. Light be. And it means come into order. Several of us have been building houses. It's been taking a long time. Boom, he just said, let be. And his whole creation just, poof, things moved, shifted, gigantic earthquakes, gigantic movements of water and land and mass. And, and he said, it's good. It's good. It's all good. And then he created the animals and the plants, and he created all those things. And again, day after day, for six days, he said, it's good. And it was good. That's an incredible concept, good. And then he created his masterpiece together with the three of them saying, let's create somebody in our image like us that we can have fellowship with. And he created man, and it, he said, it's good. You came out of Adam, I came out of Adam, and so we are part of that good. We were good. And he said, then it's not good that man should be alone. So he pulled a rib out, created woman, and said, you guys need to become one, and it will be good. 
And Adam looked at, at Eve and said, va 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 boom wow, 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 good. And it was good. We don't know how long they lived. We don't know how long they went. God said, all this creation that I've created, I've given it to you. You run it. I've given you a brilliant brain, capacity to grow, capacity to understand, wisdom from me, and I'll coach you and I'll walk with you because that's what I want. I want to be with you. But I want you to be in my image, so I want you to take your creativity. I want you to take all the things that are good inside of me and live and dominate and grow and increase. Eat anything you want. And Adam started naming the animals. He was just brilliant. And everybody was happy. It's kind of uh, quite crazy to think about all the animals being happy. All the trees being happy. Everything was good. He said, there's one thing in the middle of this thing that's a tree, and it's called the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat that fruit. But all the rest of it, it's yours, and it's good. And we know how the story went. Eve ate of the fruit because she got tricked by a snake and thinking that she would be wiser and better What's better than good? It's not like you go to the grocery store or the hardware store and says good, better, best. When God said it was good, it was it was good. There's no high, no God is good. There's no higher adjective to explain God. He's good, and all this was good. So she got tricked. I'm not sure what happened to Adam. I think he's still going va 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 boom. And said, I'm with you, hon. But anyway, they ate the fruit, and the first thing that happened was death. Because he said, in the day that you eat that, you'll die. And death came. And right on the heels of death, darkness came shame, guilt, fear, and all these things started. See, they had intimacy, as Mike was saying. God had intimacy with his creation, man. And man had intimacy with all of that God had made for him. And with each other, it was all good. And now, with free, the choice they had, now all of a sudden they had intimacy with something besides good. They had intimacy with evil. The knowledge of good and evil means that you can partake of it, recognize it, uh, par uh, participate with it, literally be the carnal knowledge, as some of you know what that means, be intimate. So when they ate the fruit, they became not only intimate with God, not only intimate with all creation, now they were intimate with evil. But they still had the intimacy of being good, but right away this intimacy of evil brought in all death, fear, selfishness, cruelty, and the kids right away had the opportunity to walk in one or the other. And Cain walked in evil and killed his brother. And now we got thousands of years of people now intimate with good and evil. But death was reigning, the separation. You know, it's a little hard to explain because God was still talking to them. Talking to us as mankind, but it wasn't quite the same. And, and I, as Michael said, we, we couldn't get back to where we were, were. We couldn't get rid of this part of us that's evil. And you and I got born and we ended up having this incredible dynamic problem in ourselves. Wanting to do good and not doing good. And wanting not to do bad and doing bad. And, and this, this battle inside of us... Has raged. But as Michael said, God had a plan and he sent Jesus. And Jesus came as a man and then he died. He, he walked as a man. He defeated Satan as a man. And, and then he, he said, okay. As everybody said, I'll go to the cross. And I, when I die, I will draw every bit of evil knowledge into my body. I'll take every sickness, every disease, every sin. I'll become sin. And I'll be separated from the Father for the first time in all existence. And I'll go to the grave. And Jesus died 
And when I say he died, I think we might want to just stop there and say he was dead dead. He wasn't mostly dead. He was dead dead. The Jesus that Peter knew before he went to the cross is not the Jesus that came out of the tomb. He died. He paid the price and he died. And as a man, he did this, but a man that was holy, to win back what we couldn't do. And the Bible says he was the firstborn of many into the new kingdom. So where I believe where how Jesus exists today is not the Jesus that existed before. And here's the deal. By faith, reading the word of God, communion with God in the, in the garden, being a young boy, reading the scriptures, and having the Holy Spirit start instructing him of who he was. He was born a baby. He didn't have the encyclopedia in his head right away. He had to grow in the grace and the knowledge of God, but he did, and he came to the realization, I am the Messiah. I must die. And I will be dead, dead. And I will have to depend on the promise that the Holy Spirit will come and get me and resurrect me. Talk about scary. No wonder he sweat blood. And as love for us is like this doesn't happen, all mankind is doomed forever. And the Holy Spirit came and raised him up. Defeated. Oh, man. I tell you what. I'm not a violent man usually. Just once in a while. But a good whooping once in a while really looks good when it's on the bad. And I like Satan getting whooped. Took the keys, took the authority, took everything. Came up out of that grave met with his people and said, it's finished. Here. I'm going to breathe on you, and when I do, just like when God breathed into Adam, only different this time. When I breathe onto you, you're going to receive my spirit, and you're going to be alive, and you will never die. You'll, Jesus will never, ever, ever die again, and neither will anybody who believes in him. Man, what a blessing. I will never die. You can't get rid of me. I'll leave this body and so will you, but I'll never die. This story is about you. All over the world today, people are going to celebrate Easter and the resurrection of Christ. And that's good. But his story is about you. Your resurrection. And Romans 6 says, if you die with him, he'll raise you up like him and with him, and you'll never die. Lake of Land's not bad. Never dying is awesome. Always being alive is awesome. Being powerful is awesome. Having everything and ruling everything with Christ. I personally think that's a worthy of celebrating. I celebrate my birthday tomorrow. It's okay. It's better than, uh, it's better, it's good. But it doesn't, doesn't compare to the celebration I'm alive. My citizenship is not here. There's a city built for me, for you. It's worth celebrating, don't you think? On the darkest hour, it's worth saying, thank you, Jesus. I'll never die.